My first question is, we were treating acute myeloid leukemia with 7 and 3 in 1977. It's 2020 today. I'm still doing the same. What do you think we can do differently to change it in another 10 years by 2030? Well, um, I do agree that compared to myeloma, um, these novel therapies and uh, uh, targeted drugs have been a, a bit late in coming to the AML arena. But uh, I do believe that in the last few years I've seen some activity there that bodes well for what uh, we may end up uh, seeing in, uh, in 2030. Um, you know, the, the amazing therapy of EPL, uh, FLT3 inhibitors, IDH inhibitors. I think there is a beginning of understanding of the fact that AML is not just one disease and that there are subtypes there and, um, you know, immunotherapy is exciting. So I think that in 2030 we'll still have uh, 7 plus 3, 3 plus 7, uh, but there'll be many other things. Uh, I did look at the SEER data and there is, in the last 20 years, there has been an improvement, maybe better supportive care. Um, so I'm a little, I'm, I'm not so pessimistic. I think uh, that things will get better for patients. Uh, even if we do nothing special and continue the way we are, I think we'll, we're on a positive uh, direction here. Yeah. Good. Well, uh, the second question is there are about 4 million papers on cancer, 150,000 in tw 2018 alone. There's a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and translation to improve therapy. What are we doing wrong? Asra, well, you know that there's no connection between numbers of papers and publications and scientific insight. I mean, come on, uh, if you look at the sheer numbers of papers and journals that we have and the pressure to publish uh, on the part of the physician, sometimes merely to hold on to the job in academic medicine, sometimes for promotions, power, prestige. So people are just publishing and uh, journals um, uh, there's an issue, you know, every month you got to fill the spaces and can you imagine a journal saying, uh, sorry, we have no great scientific insights, so there's not going to be an issue next month. So I think, uh, you know, that has to go on. And uh, conferences, um, have you been to ASH and ASCO lately? Massive, 40, 50,000 people attending and um, you simply can't take it in. I just go for the social aspects really. And uh, uh, there is such a pressure to uh, keep those meetings going. Um, um, I've been a reviewer and uh, you've got to fill all those sessions. So hardly anything gets rejected. It's, uh, you know, there's just a huge amount of information. Uh, the beast has to be fed and the beat goes on. Uh, so what's the solution? The solution maybe is to shut up if you have nothing uh, specific to say, but that's not going to happen. Uh, and great scientific insights, uh, I mean, a Shakespeare is not born every day. They are, they are rare and sometimes they can't just be manufactured at will. Um, maybe we need to have um, uh, AI um, be able to sift through this material and find us the pearls of wisdom so that we can cut out the background noise and uh, just focus on uh, the important things. Mm. So we can't drown out the noise. I think yeah. people are not going to shut up. And so maybe we need to use the tools we have to help us find the good stuff. Good answer. Third question is the fact that children respond to the same treatment better than adults seems to suggest that the cancer biology is different but also that the host is different. Well, since most cancers increase with age, even having good therapy may not matter, as the host is decrepit. Solution? So, you know, I, you're asking this question of a myeloma physician. And so I, all my patients are older. So age is an ever-present factor. And I think in this era of 
individualized targeted therapy, some of the smart drugs we have, we can customize or craft a treatment to navigate um, taking into account all the facets and age is just one more facet of the disease. Uh, so it's a different disease and a different person. Uh, you can't just have a one-size-fits-all treatment approach. And what I found uh, is that in taking care of myeloma patients, age is actually sometimes a welcome aspect because the pressure to eke out a 10-year survival is not there. I have a 90-year-old patient getting chemotherapy and you know myeloma is not curable and so if I can get a few years focus on quality of life elderly patients have time to take care of themselves they don't have the competing uh, problems of you know a job at risk uh, little children to feed and sometimes just coming to the clinic to see us is the highlight of their month or their week and so it's not such a bad thing always Very interesting answer. Now you've great knowledge and experience in the field. If you were given <coughs> limitless resources to find and plan a cure for cancer, what would you do? You know, I'm a very organized and methodical person. I like to approach everything systematically. And so I would approach it like the war that it is, our mission with deadlines and have a central command force, uh, central command that uh, will delineate the problem um, and invite groups to work on different tasks, task forces, and make sure that it's coordinated uh, with, uh, there's a coordinated plan, and that we have periodic meetings which are um, purposeful. Uh, where people uh, then will report back and then maybe we can redefine the mission and the plan and then people go out into the field. So teamwork, uh, but um, with enough room for individual inspiration. I mean, we can't block those epiphanies. You know, it's not going to be something that's forced upon people. Uh, I think that right now, um, you know, research is, seems to be progressing in a kind of a random, whimsical fashion where different groups are just working on whatever they want and uh, sometimes everyone's working on one thing and there's another very obvious question that's not being addressed mm -hmm. and uh, people are not obliged to report so you hear about somebody they got a grant or they started working on a project and then you think oh what happened and they just stopped working <laughs> on the project mm -hmm. so this kind of random disorganized uh, uh, process, I think, mm -hmm. if it was all sort of tied in together. Uh, we do have uh, these uh, grant funding agencies that they uh, come up with RFAs and they are trying to elicit answers to specific important questions, but one gets a feeling that they're working in pockets mm -hmm. and they're not necessarily all working together. So I think for me it would be uh, a more systematic uh, approach mm -hmm. and um, with defined problems. One massive grant. I love proposal. your answer. <laughs> <laughs> Last question, Seema, is a little bit of a philosophical one. Offering patients with advanced stage non curable cancers palliative but toxic treatments is a service or a disservice in the current therapeutic landscape? So, once again, you know, I'm I specialize in multiple myeloma, which is not a curable condition. Um, but patients can live for 20 years. I've been in Chicago for 20 years and I've got patients from the first day uh, that I had clinic uh, that sort of follow up with me. Uh, they're not cured. Um, we have to keep tinkering away with it. And you never know, you never know how someone's going to tolerate something, what the toxicity is going to be, what the efficacy is going to be. So I always have a hope that uh, we'll pull something out of our hat. And in fact, when I try to send patients to hospice, some of them say, well, you know, they just laugh because they don't believe that uh, that will ever happen. And it, I remember when we first used thalidomide, um, mm. I gave it to a patient of mine who was going home to die. And um, when I handed him the bottle of pills, I said, you know, Jimmy, uh, at the very least, it's going to help you sleep well at night and just swallow the pills. 
And I went off to India and came back and I was surprised that there were still faxes coming in from him. I thought he would have passed away by now. And when I looked at the results, he was having labs every week. Uh, every subsequent lab was showing a response, uh, you know, deepening response. So I think uh, I would always or on the side of uh, giving therapy, but I would uh, make it a point to help the patient understand uh, the risks and benefits and then allow them to choose. Because who am I to decide what what one is willing to endure in, in order to live? Well, thank you so much. Those are beautiful answers and thank you for your time. Thank you.